Good evening, everyone. This is the Monday, May 22nd, 2023 meeting of the Northampton Historical Commission. And just a uh, notice that the meeting is being recorded. Um, we always begin these meetings with public comment. And if there are those in attendance who are uh, uh, wanting to comment on any item that's not already on the agenda, um, we'd be happy to hear it. And if you do have such comments, please um, introduce yourself and provide your address and raise your hand. Um, yes, Jacqueline. Hi, uh, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, good evening. Thank you for um, giving me this opportunity to speak. And um, I'm just going to go to my email. I had sent Sarah and, and some of the folks for whom I have email addresses on the commission an email um, with four questions. So I'll just rattle those off real quick. And if you have any answers for them, I would really appreciate it. And if not, maybe at another meeting, we can circle back to them. But um, the I'll first check on, before you keep going, could you please identify yourself and your um, oh, provider sure. address? Thank you. Sorry about that. Jacqueline McCraner, North Street in Ward 3. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay, so the first question is um, the sequence that residents can expect events to unfold regarding um, the two public outreach sessions for the Barrett Planning Group's updated historic preservation plan, and then the unveiling of the plan itself by the Barrett Planning Group. So if you guys have dates to share, that's wonderful. But if you don't, just what the order is for those three um, events. Um, my second question is the um, I think it was in a February 2023 Historical Commission meeting, um, somebody on the commission mentioned that the uh, Barrett Planning Group had recommended that the Historical Commission and the Planning Board um, hold a joint um, meeting. I think that was, was recommended, if I'm not mistaken, to happen before the unveiling of the updated Historic Preservation Plan, but... Um, I'm not entirely sure about that. It was just the recommendation that there be a joint meeting between uh, the planning board and the historical commission. So I was wondering if, if anything had been done um, regarding that. And then my third and fourth questions have to do with um, the historical commission's role in the mass. Um, the Google Fi wireless subscriber you have called is not available. Please leave a message after the tone. Deb, please call me. I can't get any sound and I need um, to. Harriet, could you please? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jackie, continue, please. Thanks. Yeah. I'll wrap this up real quick. Um, three and four were just uh, questions I have about the Historical Commission's role um, on the mat or regarding the mass dots, Northampton downtown complete streets corridor and intersection improvements on Main Street Route 9 project. So it's role, your guys' role and then your stance on the narrowing of Main Street so that it's one way in each direction, which I hear is you know, being proposed to um, reduce vehicular traffic, cyclists, pedestrians, safety. Hey, hey Nick, can you ask Dev um, if she has Harriet, a phone please, number? Harriet, I can't, Harriet, I'm on Jesse's thing and I can't get um, the speaker, my Harriet, speaker to work. So I have to, you know, call in. Can you ask her if she's got. I'm, I'm hanging up here because she's telling me to hang up. She's on, she said. I'm sorry, uh, Jackie, please continue. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, so my last, so the questions are the, uh, the Historical Commission's role in, in that project and then the Historical Commission's stance on narrowing Main Street for vehicular traffic, cyclists, pedestrian safety. Um, Northampton's wide sweeping curving Main Street is a historic and character defining hallmark of downtown Northampton. It's existed for centuries. So I'm curious what the Historical Commission stance is on forever altering um, that, that historic feature of downtown Northampton. All right. Hey, thank um, you. Yeah, Jackie, yeah. I'm going to address both of those subjects in the chair's report, which will be coming up um, after the public comment on the agenda. Lovely. Thank you so much, Martha. 
You're welcome. Uh, and then we have Steve Jones. Uh, I'm not actually Steve Jones. Um, I'm Adele Franks. Um, and I, I wasn't clear on exactly um, when a person should make a public comment if something is on the agenda. Should I hold my comment if it's about something on the agenda? Um, that would be preferable, um, Adele. Just uh, there will be opportunity to comment publicly uh, on the subject or the agenda item during the discussion. Thank you. I'll hold You're it. Welcome. Okay. And then we have Jacqueline Balance. Hi, hi. Uh, I have a question about the historical uh, commission. Local historic district guidelines for window replacements. Is that a state guideline or is that a local ordinance? Um, we'll be, uh, Jackie, we're going to be addressing that during the discussion of thank you, um, thank you, the 300 Elm Street project. Okay, does anybody else in the public have any comments they would like to make? All righty, um, I have a brief chair's report and it looks like Barbara's joined us. Am I right, Barbara? Is that a yes? Yeah, yes, I, I somehow had trouble getting in or logging on or whatever. No worries, I'm glad I'm here. I'm here. here, it's good to see you. All righty, um, the first on the, uh, item on the agenda that I wanted to talk about was the preservation plan. And um, there were a couple of questions that were put forth by both Jackie McCreener and then also uh, others who had written in. And this is um, what the status of things uh, tonight. Um, one is that um, we are still waiting on recommendations from the Barrett Planning Group. Um, those should be coming soon. We don't know exactly when. And um, when we get those and before they are uh, released to this public, there will also be some information about the public outreach sessions, which will take place uh, sometime during the summer. Um, the question also was raised about the joint meeting between the Historical Commission and the Planning Board. And that may be a recommendation of the Barrett Planning Group. It was a, um, a, a suggestion that was made by one of the commissioners, but uh, it, 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 we, we don't know yet whether that, that will be in the recommendations or not. So that remains to be seen. Um, regarding the changes in downtown, um, I, I wanted to say that we, the commission did review the Main Street Complete Streets project back in November of 2021. And this is part of the, um, Section 106 review that's required by Mass Historical Commission because it's a federal funded project, partly. And the minutes from the meeting um, state that the commission agreed that the street contour will not be changing and the overall historic character of the downtown National Register, Register is not being affected. And that was our uh, joint meeting, uh, I'm sorry, meeting with all members present except for one. So that's on the record in that regard. Um, and then finally, I wanted to um, just comment or share with the commissioners, there's a workshop that's coming up in June um, regarding building reuse, uh, building re reusing buildings um, and preserving historic spaces as a means of lowering our carbon footprint. This is being hosted by Mass um, DEP and it's a free um, virtual meeting. And if you're available, it's from 1.30 to 3 on June 7th. Um, Sarah can send the link to this information. Um, it looks, you know, great. It'd be a lot of great ideas possibly in here for helping to, again, hold on to our historic buildings and the positives of keeping them rather than removing them. Okay, that's it for my report for tonight. Um, we have a set of minutes that we, need to look at everybody's uh, received those. <clears throat> and they are from April 24th of this year. So everyone had a chance to take a look at those. And does anyone have any comments? 
Uh, no, I would I would make a motion that the minutes be approved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Mm, so, yes, sir, I just saw one typo, which I can send to you. Um, other than that. All right. Okay. So, uh, roll call vote. Barbara. Uh, yes. Greg. Yes. Steve. Yes. And Martha. Yes. Thank you, unanimous. Thank you. Yes. Next on the agenda is the continuation of the public hearing of uh, the request for a local historic district certificate of appropriateness pursuant to section 195 of the New Hampton Code for proposed replacement windows um, at 300 Elm Street, map ID 31A-182. And the question, um, just I'll answer this right now. Um, the local historic district, the Elm Street Historic District, which was established in the 90s, um, was organized around the um, state um, Massachusetts general law that allows for the formation of these. Um, the specifics of the district, for example, what would be allowed, permitted, what would not be permitted, were something that um, the study committee that created the district or helped prepare to create the district, working with the uh, local homeowners at the time, property owners at the time, as well as the general public crafted. And those went through a public, public vetting process and then uh, eventually were adopted by city council. So I guess to answer the question about whether this is a local uh, versus a state, it's both. Um, we are adhering to the legislation which created the ability for communities to create these districts but we as a local entity um, were the ones who uh, provided the definition of uh, what actually went into the district. So I hope that answers that question. Mm, okay. Um, we have a lot of information that was provided to us. Um, just to remind folks, um, the applicant is requesting the replacement of 10 windows. There are 19 in total, but 10 are within the purview of the uh, historical commission because they are visible from a public way and at our last meeting um, we had a lot of discussion about this a presentation from the window maker um, they're intended to be replaced with the fiberglass windows and um, we had asked specifically for some additional information from the applicant who is jessica brand who i believe is here tonight and uh, one of those things was um, assessment of their condition. And in a, um, Jessica, you provided a lot of uh, in, uh, photographs. And um, also in the support material were some uh, opinions uh, by some architects. Um, and then also um, a letter from a window restoration specialist in the Boston area who did uh, say that they could be repaired um, and then provided a price tag. Um, just to remind the commissioners, the price um, for replacement was put forth at $25,000, and this is going to be partly uh, financed or maybe wholly by a mass save um, uh, loan. Fully um, financed by the mass save loan. Fully financed, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and the price for restoration, at least from the one uh, window restoration specialist, was fifty-seven thousand. So we need to decide tonight um, whether we want to award a certificate um, of um, appropriateness for this project. Um, we want to deny the certificate or we, our third option would be to award a certificate of hardship based on financial con, uh, concerns. Um, and so I just would ask the uh, commissioners if you have, first of all, any comments based on, or questions based on uh, the information that's been provided by the applicant. Greg? Uh, yes, Mar <clears throat> yes, Martha, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, the email that we received um, within the last couple of days was 41 pages of photos of windows in complete disrepair. So my question to Justice, what would be easiest for you, a certificate of appropriateness 
or a certificate of hardship for you to move forward and get these windows replaced? Um, a certificate of hardship would be great. A certificate of appropriateness would also work, but I am totally willing to take a certificate of hardship. And I actually have a PowerPoint if if anyone's interested in seeing it. I've spent quite a bit of time, but I hope that answered your question. I'm I'm totally interested in a certificate of hardship if that's what the commission is willing to grant me. Mm -hmm. I, in my view, it, it needs to be done. The windows are are in horrible shape. Her um, her tenants froze last winter. I believe that Jess has put a lot of effort into finding windows that are um, aesthetically pleasing to uh, people driving past on Elm Street. And um, other than any thoughts from Steve or Barbara or anybody else on the commission, um, but that's, I think we should let, let this poor girl get what she needs done. Uh, Greg, just I just want to, before Barbara Steve, um, you uh, say anything, I just wanted to remind um, the commissioners and also those present, we as a commission acting as the stewards of the local historic district, mm -hmm. um, our, our directive is to assess applications based on two things. One is whether it meets the U.S. Secretary of the Interior standards for historic preservation, and second, on the guidelines that have been, the design guidelines that have been um, written and uh, adopted by the city council. Those are the criteria that we use to evaluate. Um, it's great getting a lot of uh, public opinion and public support. We're not discounting that, but our charge is to base the decisions on the applications um, based on those two documents. Okay, mm -hmm. Steve or Barbara? Um. I just have a question. Um, Jess was saying that the PowerPoint or the information you have is that in a, is that different information than what you sent to us before than what we were, we've seen? Um, it contains a lot of the same. It contains some information on the state sanitary code, um, and uh, so it has a, a little some additional information. But it doesn't have any does it have any additional information on. Um, uh, assessing in some ways individual windows to see which ones somebody felt were repairable versus which ones weren't really repairable. Because I know there was somebody who who gave a quote on uh, repairing um, a certain number of windows, but I think in all the information you gave us, there wasn't really a, a definitive assessment of which ones really needed to be replaced versus repaired. All 10 windows need to be replaced. They all are coming apart at the seams, at the frames. There are holes. There are holes through the frames. There's water penetration. Literally every window that I picked up and took pictures of the bottom of had cracks where you could see where the frame was coming apart. It had dry rot. It was splitting. There is no window that does not need to be replaced. And um, that makes sense because they're all the same age. They've all been maintained under the same circumstances. Right. Well, then I'm maybe I'm a little confused. You're saying you feel they all need to be replaced, but you have an estimate from someone who is going to rebuild those windows. That's right. OK. The estimate was because but, you had asked me to get an estimate for restoration. Right. But he was restoring them, not technically replaced. They, they wouldn't be replaced with completely new windows or. He was only those going windows to restore. Would be repaired. Yes, me? he was going to repair for $57,000. Okay. Um, all right, that's all I have to say at the moment. Thanks, Barbara. Steve, do you have any thoughts, comments? Um, one comment and no questions. Just wanted to thank the applicant for all this information. I think we were um, trying to figure out the case on the fly as we were talking last week and a lot of different kinds of questions came up and we now, to my mind, we have in front of us the kind of evidence that will be useful for making a decision. So thank you for all the hard work that it takes to bring this all together and um, supply it to the commission for its decision-making process. You're welcome. 
So Steve, Greg, and Barbara, do you um, do you feel like you need to see more information from Jess? Would you like her no. to look at the PowerPoint? Steve, Barbara, no, Greg says no. Um, it just said it wasn't really much. It wasn't really new information. So unless it was something new, I don't see the need. Okay. If, if you want Steve. us to make sure we've seen everything, it's fine with me to do it. I just okay. wasn't sure how much I know that my submission was very long and I wasn't sure how much people were able to get through over the weekend. Um, so I kind of distilled it down into bite sized chunks. So um, if anybody hasn't had a chance to read through it, um, I didn't really go into the state sanitary code and those requirements in uh, the submission. I do have a lot of information on that um, in terms of its requirements for windows and for uh, maintaining and fixing dangerous um, conditions, dangerous living conditions. So um, if everyone feels like they've been able to digest the large packet I sent, then you know you don't have to see the PowerPoint. Any, uh, uh, Steve, so do you, Barbara? I think we have the information ahead. that we need, yeah. Okay, all right. So um, I was able to look at your information, Jess, and I, I agree with Steve, I really appreciated you taking the time to pull all that together. Um, the photographs are very helpful as well as the information from the window restoration specialist. And this is where I'm coming down on this, but again, it's just one opinion or one thought. Um, I, I, I don't think this um, replacement is necessarily in line with our charge, which is the Secretary of the Interior standards or our design, um, our design guidelines, our design standards. However, I do see that there is a huge cost difference. And I think if this were, um, you know, a, a case for um, arguing for a certificate of hardship um, that I, I'm, I would be willing to um, discuss that. Anybody else? Um, I would I would really agree with what you're saying. Again, replacing these windows is not ideal, but um, I also would lean towards um, discussing and possibly issuing um, a certificate of hardship. And yeah, we know how great. He's put a lot of effort into finding windows that are um, not just an ordinary window, but I think she's found done a lot of work to find a window that is um, suitable um, for the period. So if we're at a stage where I can make a motion, and I'm sorry, I'm new here. So are, <clears throat> can I make a motion or are we at that stage yet? Um, so I would just ask Steve if you have any additional thoughts on it. Yeah, or Steve, if you want to make the motion. Um, no, I'll just add in that I found the letter from um, Jonathan Salvan to be persuasive, that um, to have an expert opinion, it is an opinion, as Martha indicates, but to have an expert opinion and someone who um, is able to uh, make that assessment I think um, gives us some evidence of beyond repair. And I think one could argue if it is, you know, highly infeasible um, to pursue repair. And we have an architect who says that they're beyond repair. Um, hypothetically, you could do this, but I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, I found that persuasive. I'll just put it, I'll just put it that way. So yeah. I think that's that's provides us with some evidence that's useful. All right. Um, I guess I would ask if there are any members of the public who would like to make any comments at this point before we take a uh, entertain a motion. And Jacqueline again. Hi, Jacqueline McCraner, uh, North Street, Northampton. Um, I'm in the position of Je as Jess, kind of in having a very old home and finding repair. You know, I don't know. I'm not a landlord, but um it, they get very expensive very quickly can the commission or Jess kind of describe the difference between the replacement window versus 
um, what the repairs would entail because it seems like they might be single pane um, windows or what I'm trying to say is not highly ener energy efficient windows if they're historical windows and are they all like facing Main Street or I'm sorry Elm Street and would it make sense to do some of them repair some of them and replace some of them is that even an option so yeah just a kind of comparison between the two options and then you know out of all the 10 windows do some of them not face Elm Street and that could be a candidate for replacement versus restoration. Thank you. So as I said in the introduction, um, there are 19 windows total, a ton of them face Elm Street, and those are the ones that we are considering because they are visible from the public way. And Odessa, do you want to comment quickly on that, on the question? Um, yeah, I, I want to just, so the ones that are visible from the public way are visible down, down a, um, there are two driveways. So there, there's one that's actually street facing, like right facing the street. The rest of them can be seen down a driveway. Um, they're not as visible as a actual street facing window. Um, and I guess to answer that question, all funding is through the Mass Save Heat Loan. Um, I was going to explain in my uh, PowerPoint, but my I'm a state employee. I have a modest income, my business, uh, broke even in 2021 and in 2022, my expenses were greater than my income and everything that I make goes back into this building. So there are no funds for replacement, uh, for restoration and restoration will restore single pane to single pane. The quote that I was given does not include glass pane restoration or replacement and it does not include screens and it does not include storms. And those would still be required not only for occupant comfort, uh, but to abide by and not be in violation of the state sanitary code for landlords and tenant housing. So um, it, it would be economically infeasible to try and restore these windows for multiple reasons. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, sure. Jenny. Hi, thank you so much, Martha. I just want to uh, Thank the uh, committee for really listening to Jess and um, and reading her stuff carefully. And I just want to say, uh, just to speak as a neighbor, Jess is a fantastic landlord. And I think a lot of this comes out of her attentiveness, both to her house and to the people who live there. And it's I just, as somebody who lives right, like I'm looking over at Jess's house, the care she puts into it and takes with it is phenomenal. And I just envision if this hardship certificate doesn't go through it won't she does not have the funds to do anything else and I could see this building which is beautiful just falling into disrepair and being passed on to someone else who wouldn't put the same care into it so again I, I'm really heartened to hear this might be a possibility and um, I really can't say enough great things about Jeff both just both as a tenant uh, manager of her tenants um, but as a steward of her building hey, thanks Jen Adele? Thank you. Um, so when I heard about uh, this problem, I was kind of mystified about uh, what, what the Historical Commission's concerns were, but now I think I understand them. But as an energy efficiency advocate, um, I am uh, horrified at the thought that um, that the restoration not only would be incredibly expensive, but also would not increase the energy efficiency of this building. And so uh, in, in order to meet Northampton's goals of carbon neutrality by 2050, we're going to have to do a heck of a lot of energy efficiency upgrades. Uh, so. Um, so I urge you um, to facilitate this landlord doing the right thing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adele. Rachel? There we go. Hi, good evening. Um, yeah, first of all, I just wanna thank each of you for your service to our community. And yeah, I'm here because I, I have some concerns about the effects of, of, of this um, project or, you know, its ability to go forward on the health and well-being of, of the tenants. 
at 300 Elm. Um, you know, I appreciate the, the mission of this commission and that, you know, it helps maintain what's special and unique about our little city. And, you know, I think part of, you know, especially the, when, when counselors talk about preservation, we're also think of preservation as keeping things viable, usable, relevant, and accessible. And so citywide, citywide, you know, we have these lofty climate goals and our energy efficiency goals. And as well, we also have a lot of quality affordable housing goals, and we'd like to increase the, the amount and quality of our rental units. And so we have these goals. To, um, we also want to support our residents in the time when the cost of living is skyrocketing. And so I'm concerned. I'm concerned about the undue burden on homeowners in general and on this homeowner. Um, but also <clears throat> when we make large expenses, when there are large expenses for homeowners uh, who rent, that's often handed down to the tenants and with rent increases. And I don't want to see that as a kind of a way forward for preservation, you know, for preservation. So I think it's something we have to hold in, in uh, as, as part of the equation. Um, it seems like there's a solution to this, the window frames and it, that's actually doable and is in with, within the reach of the a homeowner and uh, does not seem to uh, impact uh, the public way of view because the windows you know, that are proposed, to me, they look like the same as the original. So I, I guess we have to think about who, you know, who's our audience here. This is for, it's by the community, and it's for the community. So I guess I'd say with such neg negligible gains from denying the request of hardship or appropriateness, then the reality, um, you know, coupled with the rea reality of the current alarming, you know, quality of life situation that's going on over there, you know, I guess I would urge you to center um, doing the right thing for all the residents, supporting this resident, supporting the tenants, supporting um, those who go by and look at it, who, who I think will be pleased with this result. So I urge you to approve uh, the request. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Rachel. So, Gerald? Yes, good, good evening. Um, and could you please identify yourself? Thank yeah, you. My, my name is Gerald Baker. My daughter is a friend of Jess's, and I'm here in Northampton visiting with my daughter. And because this, uh, and because this is a topic that uh, touches on uh, my former career before I retired, my daughter asked me to tune in and comment if I wished. Um, I'm a carpenter. I retired as a carpenter. Uh, I've worked on hundreds of houses dating from 1890 to uh, to the 1950s in the neighborhoods that I worked in Indianapolis. And I've rebuilt a lot of windows. And what you end up with is a window that is, you know, maybe a little bit more efficient. Um, but it seems to me that in this in this time. That there are a lot of state subsidies trying to influence people to, you know, to make improvements in their um, the usage of energy. And so I, I it, it strikes me as contrary that the commission would uh, hold back a you know permission for a more uh, efficient window system. Um, also, I, I reiterate the you know comments that were made earlier about the cost. I mean um to rebuild windows is you know very uh, labor intensive and uh and if all you're going to end up with it's uh a window that's going to last another 50 60 years but it's going to save no energy in the interim then that seems like you're only getting half of the job done so uh i hope you approved the permit uh, so she can get her new windows uh, and save some money on heating costs and satisfy her tenants that uh, apparently have been spending some cold winters in those rooms with windows. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, is it Devorah? You're muted, Devorah. Thank you. I'm Devorah. Um, I'm Jess's sister. Um, and I just wanted to chime in that I spent a lot of time visiting her and 
it is absolutely freezing and uncomfortable and unhealthy in her apartment. Um, and just over the years, I've heard about all of the issues her tenants have had in just being very cold and her not being able to do anything to help them. Um, the windows also, one is by some stairs, so you could fall through it uh, if you fell down the stairs. An uh, owl flew through another one and luckily wasn't hurt, but it just shows how thin the glass is. So I just hope you approve um, her to get double pane glass so she can solve the problems for herself and her tenants and keep everybody healthy. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Tamara. And Jackie? Yeah. Hi, Jackie Balance from Florence. I, I want to echo what uh, Adele said that the overriding issue now, here and now, is climate and our energy and sustainability plan says that we have to do, well, science says we have to take every step we can now. And I'm wondering, I would like to address Rachel to say, if it's a local, if these guidelines are part of the local ordinance, could we not change the guidelines to be in harmony with our energy and sustainability plan and or follow up with the Barrett Planning Group energy and uh, what are they calling it? Sustainable preservation plan because sustainability is so critical. It's life and death. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. And then we have Peter and Christine. Peter and Christine, yes. are you there? Okay. Yes. Hi, Peter and Christine Gray Mullen. We are in Amherst. Um, we have a uh, interest in historic commissions and also involved with some of the boards and committees here. So um, I just wanted to speak out in support of the applicants either getting a hardship or otherwise appropriate approval this evening. Um, I speak from the level of uh, sympathy with what the commission is trying to address, which is intent. I, uh, my day job is director of construction with the UMass Building Authority, and we do hundreds of millions of dollars worth of construction annually. And the Historic Commission and Mass Historic Commission requirements are part of every project we do, so I take it very seriously. But one of the things that is part of this is intent. And I think the, the applicant has gone through an awful lot to try and provide a, a solution that meets the intent of what those guidelines there in Northampton are required to be. And I think that's very important. So the intent is there. The economic hardship is serious and it's a real one. These aren't million dollar projects, but to Jess, it's important to get the windows done, to make her tenants more comfortable, to save energy, and also to invest in other things in the building that will help her tenants and the building's energy efficiency long-term. So I think it's a solution. I think it's a solution that the community there in Northampton and the Elm Street District would support. So I hope you can look to support that hardship tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Okay. I think at this point, um, we are ready to um, entertain a motion. If someone would like to do that. I will uh, entertain that. Um, I make a motion that we grant Jessica Brandt a hardship, our certificate of hardship so she can pursue her project at 300 Elm Street. Is there a second? I would second that. Okay. Any further discussion amongst the commissioners? All right, I think we're ready to take a vote, Sarah. All right, so roll call vote, Barbara? Yes. Greg? Yes. Steve? Yes. And Martha? Yes. All right, you're unanimous. Thank you. Thank you so much. You have made me happier than I could ever explain. I am so happy to hear that. Thank you. 
congratulations, Jess. I hope the house works out well for you and everything in Northampton. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you. And Sarah, I just wanted to make sure that it's included in the minutes that um, we, you know, appreciate it. Well, we were, uh, we acknowledge that the, um, the project did not, it, that was in conflict somewhat with the standards of the National Park Service as well as the district. Thank you. Okay. All right. The next one on the agenda is the proposed exterior restoration work uh, pursuant to a store preservation agreement, or excuse me, restriction agreement at 20 Holly Street, uh, the Holly Apartments, former St. John Canius Church. And um, I, I understood that a number of you were able to make the on-site visit, uh, which was, I think, last week, was that? Yes. And it sounded like it was a great discussion. And um, so I believe um, what we're doing here tonight is we are uh, reviewing it once again, and then we do need to take a vote on whether we uh, approve of the work that is being done on the exterior pursuant to the preservation restriction. Um, do we do have Mark Thaler here, I see, and also, yeah, Sarah. Or somewhere on there. Um, and I was not at the visit, so I'm going to depend on those of you who were. But um, I guess what I would say, do um, do people need to see any more information about that project? We did look at a, we have a thorough presentation at the last meeting. Um, Mark went through all of the drawings to show the work that was being done, proposed. You got to see it on site at the site visit. Um, were there any questions that those who attended the visit had that you would like to pose to either Mark or Sarah at this point to clarify? I have no questions. Okay, thanks. Greg or Sarah, or Steve, Steve or Sarah, or Steve or Barbara, excuse me. No, no, I think the, the presentation that we got is and then in addition, the um, on-site visit where we had a discussion um, was probably gives me all the information I need. It's very helpful. And Steve, any? Yeah, I would just add thank you to Sarah and Mark and um, Sarah, two Sarahs, <laughs> for um, coordinating the visits. It, there's nothing like seeing the building in person. So um, it really made a big difference. Thank you for coordinating that. Okay. And, you know, my only um, comment slash question, uh, and this may have been resolved at the site visit, was about the east facade of the building um, and the placement of the windows on that. I don't know whether that was raised at the site visit or not, Mark and Sarah. It just, it's not a facade that many people see, I realize. And I do think the addition of windows is helping it. Um, the arrangement and the sizing proportions just seemed um, a little... Uh, to me, you know, designed from the inside out. You were, I know, it's, and you explained, Mark, really clearly, it's a complicated uh, situation inside to get a winter pattern that, you know, um, has some grace to it from the outside, I guess, to put it simply. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wonder if you had given any more thought to that. The window placement, I, and actually it was one of the things that was uh, brought up at the walkthrough, the, the reason why the the third floor windows actually are offset uh, from the second floor windows is yeah. because in those corners, there uh, are actually uh, structural bracing that goes up so that um, that sort of ties in the, the roof structure uh, into the sidewalls. So you can't have the window that close but I didn't want to take the second floor windows and move them over as well, because then they would be offset from the first floor windows. And so mm -hmm. seeing that there's a gable roof there anyway, the sort of stepping in mm -hmm. seemed to be, you know, the better of two evils, I guess, um, you know, to be able to try to uh, make that transition. Yeah. I understand. And you, you sort of explained that the last time. Um, so, okay, it, it answers my question. Um, do, does anybody have anything else? And um, we do need to vote on this. Um, and the preservation restriction is still 
um, not completely settled, correct? Uh, it's like 98% finalized. finalized, I would say. Okay. Mass Historic just had some minor comments about the order of the exhibits and um, like the structure of sentences, but the, you know, what it looks like and what it defines is acceptable major versus minor projects and um, historically related items that is finalized. Okay. All right. Um, well, if there's no more discussion about this, and again, thank you, Sarah, and Mark for accommodating us and um, you know letting us come to the site and look at it. Um, I would entertain a motion to support the exterior work at this point. So moved. And second, 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 second that. All right. Is there any more discussion? And it was one of the people. Uh, I, and I know I'm not alone. Obviously, you, Martha, also. Um, you know, the, the not being real happy with that facade where the windows are being added and stepped in. But I think also if, um, you know, and all we're really able to do with this preservation is preserve the outside of the building. Um, but um, I think that we have to realize that if buildings are gonna be reused, particularly for another use, that they do have to have some kind of modifications. And in this case, you, be very hard to have living spaces without any windows on that, any additional windows in that facade. So I understand that. I mean, again, that's the change that makes me the least happy. But mm -hmm. um, we did find that looking at it on site, that it's not, it really isn't a particularly visible facade from the outside. Um, so uh, anyway, that's all I have to say. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Barbara. Um, so Greg has made a motion. Would someone like to second that? I, I think I did that before I made my comment. Oh, did you? I didn't hear you. I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. Okay. So um, if there's no more discussion, I think, Sarah, again, we're ready to take a vote. All right. So roll call. And is the motion clear to you? Yes. yes. The motion clear. So this would okay. be to um, find the work appropriate pursuant to the terms of the uh, preservation restriction. Correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, roll call vote. Barbara? Yes. Greg? Yes. Steve? Yes. And Martha? Yes. You get it. Okay. Um, all right. So the next, and thank you again, Mark and Sarah, for up, appearing again. Um, and we really appreciate the work that you're doing there. It's uh, I, I'm just uh, amazed uh, <laughs> that that building is, um, yeah, is being saved and is being transformed. It's really quite something. So, you know, great work. Well, thank, well, thank you. you, everyone. We appreciate yeah. it. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the request for an architectural access board variance from top, for Talbot House at 25 Prospect Street. This is a property owned by Smith College. And um, Steve, you're welcome to participate in the conversation. Um, you probably need to recuse yourself. Oh, we don't need to vote on this. Mm -hmm. So That's we're just having a discussion about it. Um, one of the things that um, confused- I, I just to interject uh, briefly, I will recuse myself as usual from, okay. as, as an employee of a college, so. Yeah, yeah. great, no worries. Um, one of the things that was a little confusing to me and maybe the others too in reading um, the application information, um, we're not, we were not aware that this is on the state register. Um, I think Sarah looked into that and found that that was the case. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we're happy to review this um, and put our two cents where our opinion in about the work that's being proposed. Um, we won't be voting on anything. And, you know, having gone through the AAB myself, um, several times, um, I know having support from the local commission of source is helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah. But just to clarify, it is, it's not uh, listed on the state register or national register or part of the local historic district. It's so, just in the state inventory. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, so is it Tom that's- Tom, Thomas? Yep, Tom Hartman, yep. Um, 
Tom, do you want to just um, give us uh, just an overview of what's being proposed? Um, I thought your middle was quite good, but I think it would be helpful for the rest for the rest of people to see that. Sure, I'll give a five seven minute presentation that should cover the basis, Perfect. and then we can go into more detail. Great. Okay, so uh, here's the building. Here's Elm Street. Here, Talbot House is located right here. Okay, so one second, so I think you need this. to- Oh, sorry, hold on. Uh, let's go back to share my screen. There we go. Can you see that? Not yet. No, we can. Yep. Okay, great. So Elm Street is here. Here's the campus, the museum. Talbot House is up on Prospect Street a ways back. It's not in the historic district. Um, it's just beyond it. Um, the inventory from the state is here. So it's 25 Prospect Street is the proper address. Built in 1909, it's 30,000 square feet. Um, there's a seven and a half million dollar project proposed there in two phases to replace the windows, to put in um, an all new mechanical system to connect to the college's low temp hot water um, geothermal system that they're, they're doing. And um, as a result of the project size, the cost of the project, it triggers full compliance with the Architectural Access Board. Um, so if you have a project, any project within three years added together over 30% of the assessed value, of the building, it, you have to go through a variance process. So we're in the middle of that variance process and I'll explain that context a little more in a second. But essentially this 30,000 square foot building is assessed at a mere $2.9 million. So, you know, that, that's a big building for, for that much money on the books. Um, so let's go to the next one. So here's a historic photograph of, I think this is around the turn of the century. You can see it's a Gambrel roof with a front porch. And this is what it looks like today. So it's uh, got a sidewalk that runs along Prospect Street and then a sidewalk that comes in, I think six risers up to a porch and then steps into the building. And this porch is specifically what I'm gonna ask you your opinion about, um, but I'll explain the project at large that's happening. And then as you go further north on Prospect Street, this is a view, the school is right over here. There's a parking area that comes down and then an ex um, a lower entrance. There's a bike kitchen there, which is open to the entire campus. That's where they have, it's a bike repair shop essentially. Um, and then on the ground level, there's a lounge, there's a kitchen, there's common spaces on the ground level. And there's also common spaces on the first floor. And then above that floors two, three, and four are all uh, bedrooms and bathrooms. Uh, so just as a reference point, I'm gonna show you some renderings in a little bit. And this is the existing porch. So let's think of the first floor level as zero. You step down a seven inch step and then um, a series of steps and so you've got three feet nine inches to make up in terms of putting a ramp on the buildings and so that's a that's a pretty significant um, grade that we're working on so this is what a variance application looks like i don't know if anyone has done with these uh, mary you mentioned you had so essentially you describe the building um, and so here are the existing floor plans so you can see here's the bike kitchen, there's a rec area, there's um, a kitchen that's there, there's a laundry on the first floor, there's the trunk room. And then on the first floor, there's a large living room and a parlor. Um, and so what you do is if you can't comply with certain aspects of the access code, like this trigger, this 30% trigger, your entire building needs to comply. So door hardware, everything, you know, and if, and so there's a threshold, which is known as impracticability, which is a term in the access code, um, which is defined as the costs are excessive to the benefits to people with disabilities. Okay, 
So if it costs us a, a large amount of money to do the, the full compliance, well, they can grant you a variance. So we requested four or five variances um, for various things, like they granted a variance not to put an elevator because that is very expensive. And the campus has plenty of elevators and exceed, far exceeds the, the need for accessible bedrooms on an elevator. So our variance request is specifically about entrances. All the entrances to the building need to become accessible. And so our design is to actually modify this pathway to make it an accessible path, because it's a little too steep right now, and make the entrance on the, the, the lower level and the bike kitchen fully accessible. They're not now. Then what we're proposing to do is between the basement or the lower level and the first floor to put in an elevator. So now you've got vertical access between the two spaces, the two floors with common spaces, okay? Um, another component of our strategy is to lift up the, the porch of the floor so that the porch is actually accessible now from the interior, okay? So you could, you could go out and be with a group of friends on the porch, which you can't do now because there's a seven inch step. So we propose that we would not have a ramp on the front of the building because we're providing access to the building, which doesn't exist now. We're connecting them two stories and we're making that space um, accessible. And to create an accessible historic entrance in this location, which I'll show you some options, it's, Three to four hundred thousand dollars, two hundred and fifty to three hundred fifty thousand dollars to do a really nice ramp that doesn't look like a ramp on this building. And I'm, and so they said, okay, they granted the variance, but they said, but you need to go through the Mass Historic Commission's AD, ADA consultant review process, which essentially they said yes to do an architecturally appropriate entrance. It's expensive, but we you can do one that doesn't cost that much which would essentially be connecting the, the, all you would accomplish is be, being able to go from here to here, right? By, by putting on this, this accessible entrance. So just some sketches for context. So here's the existing conditions. The lowest cost solution after you make this level, is there a question? Okay. No, it's just, yeah. <laughs> okay. After you make this level accessible and from the entrance, you would put a simple wood framed ramp on the front of the building. You need about 51 feet of ramp at 12% to do this, okay? Um, at one in 12, excuse me, 8%. So this is what I don't want to do. I want to be clear, what I want to do is actually nothing. I want to fix it and be granted the variance and have the Mass Historic Commission find that this particular solution would be detrimental, okay? So that's, that's essentially why we're talking. You could do an option where you go off the side of the building and you have a, a bridge or a walkway coming off the side of the building. It's about 50 feet again. And so that could be done, but that's about $200,000, I, I figure. Um, the lowest cost is you could do it bare bones, cheap, $100,000 is probably what, what this would end up costing by the time you're doing. And, and what I don't like about it is it's asymmetrical. It's chopping the steps up. It's, it's, it's I, I would <laughs> not like to do this. Um, so I wanna give you an example of a, of a project we did at Smith Washburn House. So long ago, there was a front porch on, on here, a historic front porch. It got taken out in the eighties, this got put on, that's a remnant of the old front porch. And what we did was we actually rebuilt the porch to be historically accurate, as, as pr pretty close. And we slipped the, the ramp in behind the porch, behind the columns. Um, we didn't have to, I think we only had to, had to go up about half as far, maybe even less than that is what we're talking about now. But an, a very nice, simple, elegant solution, okay? So here's the steps going up. You come in here and then you go 
up the ramp and you arrive at the top of the steps. And there's still room on the front porch to be a front porch. So I, I think that's a, that's a nice solution concept. Um, unfortunately, there's not enough room in the porch that's there to make it work. I could rebuild the whole front porch, but now we're talking half a million plus. So, you know, it's crazy money. Okay, one more concept. Um, this is a building we did at Amherst College. This is um, the service building. This first floor is accessed daily by the entire campus. So essentially what we did here was we lifted up this door and put the top of the door where the transom is. We did this last summer. Um, you know, it's a nice, elegant architectural solution. It blends into the, to the building, the brick matches. It, it, was, it was not easy. Um, and this is the, uh, sorry for the construction photo, but this is the, the finished product. That was, I think, 350 to $400,000, okay? To do, just, to do just that work. You're bringing in granite, granite steps, you know, metal railings. You're building this to last 100 years, which is the appropriate thing to do, but it's expensive. Um, if, if I was gonna propose a solution and I didn't need to be constrained by the budget, which of course on this project we are, we're actually over budget. Um, I would propose something like this. Again, the yellow is the raised platform, a small walkway down to two landings. And the difference between a walkway is a walkway doesn't have the guardrails on the side and it's 5%. A ramp does have the guardrails on the side. So if I did something like this with granite and granite steps and I've, you know, some planters in there, that's easily $300,000, $400,000, which meets that threshold again of what we defined as impracticability in my variance application of two hundred dollars to $300,000, okay? So I think essentially the, the request here is that you know, this proposed plan, this is a, a better finished drawing. Um, I can forward this to you, but this is the, the lowest cost, most feasible um, solution, which is asymmetrical to the building. And, you know, I think it looks like a ramp that was attached to this building. Um, I, I, you know, I think it, essentially the, the request is would you find this particular scheme and all the other ones that I propose for you are just for context, but would you find this to be detrimental to the architecture of the building? And the last time I went through this process was actually a long time ago, but the historic commission wrote an opinion on the proposed solution and they found it was detrimental and it compromised the integrity of the structure. Um, so one just in summary, we're in the process of variance for the access board. They granted us the ability to bring around that access to the, the entrance on the lower level to supply the vertical connection. And the variance request is specifically for connecting that lower landing to the porch at a cost of about $300,000 being that threshold of where um, it costs more than the, the actual benefits. So. Any questions? Um, Tom, on the, the, the initial scheme that you um, talked about, which was to retain the steps um, and then make a level um, transition between the interior and exterior, how are you handling that extra seven inches between the interior and exterior? Are you gonna um, ramp it on the inside of the building? No, what, what, what we actually do, and we just did this at Parsons, um, is, you know, there's the step, this is the threshold and the porch is yeah. here. We build yeah. a new sleeper structure over the existing decking mm -hmm. that's there. And then we hold back that raised platform from the exterior columns. Mm -hmm. and put a curb stop on it, um, it, it, it's actually a nice solution. Because what I find is if you ramp that seven inches with the landings, mm -hmm. you basically just destroyed the porch. Because there's not much room left on the porch after you do the ramp, after you do the transition between the, the finished floor and the lower porch floor. 
you use up right. a lot of the real estate. And for the same amount of money, you can just lift up the whole thing. Okay, so I, I, I'm, not, I'm not reading. I'm not reading you how you would actually do this. You're lifting up the floor of the porch seven inches, and mm -hmm. you're not going to be adding an extra step to the stair. You're not rebuilding the stairs to. You do. You do add an extra step at the staircase. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, and how, how is that going to work? I mean, can you? Are you going to do it inside the porch, or is it at the at the very bottom of the step, set of steps? It would be at the very top of the steps. Uh, here, let me see here. Um, so, the existing steps mm -hmm. are are right there. That's the top of the existing porch. Right. And then we would put our, let's call it our overbuild all the way around here. Let me Okay. Oops, I don't want to have that. Bear with me. So that's our overbuild because okay. that's the existing edge of the porch right now. So mm -hmm. you come up and you make one more step, and then this whole area is level with the finished floor. Okay, so basically the new the new floor, which is seven inches higher than the existing floor of the porch, is um, also the top step. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, that was a, that was really great that presentation. It was really helpful. Um, okay, okay, so um, Greg and Barbara, this is on you now because Steve has excused himself. Do you have any thoughts about this? Well, I, at the risk of sounding politically incorrect, I'm glad to hear some discussions about you know, some cost benefit analysis with putting in elevators and other things. I know that at one point, um, I don't remember whether this was City Hall, but just, or, or I guess it was the Academy of Music that the handicap, the wheelchair access was going to be either on the side of the building or at the back. And I can understand why people would object to that. And so the ramp was brought to the front of that building. Um, but I think, so I'm just wondering if you've run into any kind of um, feed, negative feedback or people saying, uh, I, you're treating me like a second class citizen because I have to enter on the side of the building or the back of the building instead of being enter on the front. But I still feel that there should be some thought to how much money is being devoted to this that could be maybe spent on something more important. Well, not mm -hmm. exactly more important, just something different. Um, so I'm just wondering again if you've had any reaction or thoughts from people um, about, um, uh, or even the board that you applied to of is there an issue with them yeah. feeling that this isn't giving the same access, even though it um, is giving access. I think what's interesting, I've, I've done and presented in front of the board many, many times. And when you present, you're actually presenting often to people who are disabled. Um, and I would note that after this hearing, I'm going to attend the, the Northampton Disability Access Commission and make the same presentation. So <laughs> if, if, if I'm going to hear it, I'm, I'm going to go get their comments on it. What's interesting about this though, is that that bike kitchen, that space that is open to the entire campus, it currently is not accessible. So we're doing something we would do for that particular space alone, regardless. So we're, we're bringing the entire campus down to that location. And you know this is, this is one of many dormitories. And in fact, this is a process that's probably gonna come before you several times in the next several years because most of the dormitories are seeing this type of work as a result of their campus system upgrades. So um, I think this particular case is, is, is much better for the solution that's proposed and more cost-effective. Um, you know, if there was a very simple $100,000, $50,000 solution, I wouldn't be 
be here in front of you, one that right. I think looks good. And that's really right. kind of the, the issue. So. Right. And I also appreciate it because I think Smith has done some unfortunate changes and entrances that um, maybe were done without as much thought as to whether or not this would work or whether the there, there are a couple yeah. small small houses on Elm Street where there was a, a little walkway and then a several stairs and all they did, what they did was they took out the stairs completely and just put in an asphalt walkway that's level to the entrance. And it's, I think it's really unfortunate and did detrimentally affect the historic look of those two houses that I'm thinking of right. that are, it's a 150 Elm Street and then the house on the corner with um, Paradise Road, which is called Tenny House. Um, I think they were unfortunate choices um, yeah. for that, but um, so I'm I'm glad to see that maybe Smith is starting to think about this in a more um, you know maybe they're just trying to save money, but you know I mean they're the the um, I think it's good to think about having houses accessible and it but not thinking it has to be at every every single door of the house i mean i right. suppose for safety purposes i'm assuming there's still more than one exit oh yes so that yep. somebody who's disabled would not have to get to a certain point and also i think part of your presentation that you sent us indicated that there were some on the first floor there were some bedrooms and a bathroom Oh yeah, there's I that. and that yeah. because of the whole mix in the college, there are enough, um, or at least maybe when they're doing more renovations, there are adequate um, uh, rooms, you know, rooms for sleeping and for, and for bathrooms, yeah. um, so yeah. that every every room in every house doesn't have to be accessible in terms, of, and particularly putting in an elevator is very costly and can really ruin the um historic fabric of the of the house yeah yeah and the access board is, is i mean they're they're very um i think they're very thoughtful on how they approach this in that threshold of impracticability you know i mean just as you said if you don't spend it on this you're probably going to spend it to upgrade or, or something else in the future as well um and if they don't like a solution they have no problem denying it so, you know, they, they think this is a robust solution. They just really want me to complete that loop with the historic commission, which, which I think is appropriate in this particular project. Hey, Greg, do you have any questions for Tom? I'm just thankful Smith College does not want to knock it down and put it in the parking lot. <laughs> Good point. I, I you know, I, I think it's, Everything that's been discussed is very appropriate concerning the cost that, uh, especially with a project that's overrun at the moment. Um, I am very thankful that it does create access to um, the building for individuals. So great job. Thank you. Um, Tom, would you mind um, putting up the photo of the existing conditions? Is that, that's not too much trouble. Uh, uh, no, I got it. Oh, that's nice. Too. Yeah. Um, and do you? What about the one that shows the bike? the The view of the bike garage. Yeah. Which is there? Okay. Um. So here's the question. Um. Where is, is there handicap parking down on that lot below? We are providing a accessible parking space there as one of the conditions of using that lower level. Yep. Okay. okay. Yeah. So there's a couple of things. I mean, I want. I think even if you're to put a ramp in here, um, there's a lot of accessibility issues. It's just getting to the bottom of the ramp. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a street that looks like it has an asphalt curb on it. There are no curb cuts. There's no mm -hmm. probably handicapped parking on it. Um, it looks like there is on street parking there, but there's certainly no accommodations made to make that transition. Um, 
So I think that would be something that would be important to point out to the access board. But I think more importantly, um, I just, I think putting a ramp on this building would just destroy the look of the front of it. It's just, it's so, um, it is such a strong symmetrical um, presence and that ramp would really throw that off. And also it would extend, it looks, um, I mean, really far to, I guess this would be to the West, right? Or maybe the South. Um, I just, I just can't envision it. I mean, I think it would really be detrimental to the historic character of this property. And I don't think it would be, you would gain anything from an accessibility standpoint to the building. Um, and I, I would, again, I think the parking issue is really important. I mean, a person who, you know, yeah, I mean, I just. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> um, you know, you have this really strong rhythm, rhythm with these heavy columns and this just ramp just completely breaks that up. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it's essentially breaking up. Um, God, the steps, you know, this has to yeah. kind of the interface between the steps and the top of the ramp is like smack dab in the middle of the door. It's just it's not um, it's not a graceful treatment at all. So I would strongly urge um, or I would strongly um, urge the commissioners to uh, try to step back and say this is not an appropriate treatment and we see um a much broader um um approach to access through the modifications that are happening at the lower level with the lift and then the parking yeah agree. and it's a it's a lula it's a full elevator i mean it's mm -hmm. it's, yep. it's not a it's not a lift it's a lula sorry about that <laughs> no it's okay and they cost more and they're better. <laughs> so. Okay. Does anybody have any other comments they want to make on this? Um, I mean, I, I probably shouldn't, I can't make the motion, but if, oh, we're not voting on it. So it doesn't matter. No. Um, so those are my, if, be my comments. And I think if, if, I, other... if I could, it might be yeah. helpful, Sarah, if I sent you a, a memorandum with the drawings in question with a specific request, and then you guys could reply to that. Is that helpful or not? Yeah. So in the past, the, although the Historical Commission is advisory to Mass Historic, the commission has felt it appropriate to weigh in um, to Mass Historic and provide them some local context and comment. Yeah. And if yeah. that's something that the commission is willing to move forward with or decides is the appropriate action here, then that's something we could do. And, and if that is the case, if, Tom, you wanted to include some, you know, draft elements that would be very helpful to me. I know exactly what to do. <laughs> okay. I think I think that's a decision um, mm -hmm. that we should we should move ahead with that, you know, unless anybody disagrees with me. Um, I agree. Yeah, I would support that as well. Okay. No vote. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Hey, good luck later on. Thanks. I'll be at it for a while, I think. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks for the presentation, Tom. Take care. You're quite welcome. Have a good night. All right. Um, we have 10 more minutes. And um, sir, do we have anything new on the Northampton New Haven Canal documentation? Uh, so I... For the April meeting, I believe I'd sent out the, the draft report, but I just wanted to give the Historical Commission a bit of an update since this was a historic um, CPA funded project and it also involved mm -hmm. adjacent canal communities. So we do have the final report now from the consultant. Um, they've identified sections where the canal is still intact and there is some sufficient funding available to be able to study those further and advance towards um, a potential national register nomination, which is exciting. It's very exciting. Yeah. Uh, and so it was considered an archaeological report. So it's um some somewhat confidential, but I everything in it should be publicly available. We do have a hard copy if anyone wants to take a look at it. It it includes a map of the entire canal area that was based on Carl Walter's initial study. Um and the, the extent to which he was able to identify that without the benefit of any computer mapping or LIDAR or anything was really pretty remarkable. Wow. 
That's great. Oh, that's great. Is that something that's going to that could get forwarded to us, or we could you could give us a link yes, to? I have the Northampton session. section only. Um, oh, okay. I have the full report for the canal um, in hard copy, but I can send the Northampton section. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if there's any other business, I just wanted, I wanted to follow up on um, so out of the discussion that took place earlier regarding the um, historic district and the you know city's commitment to um, sustainability. And I think at some point in the not too distant future, and perhaps this is something the preservation plan will um, point out, maybe not, that we may want to revisit um, the guidelines to see if there are any ways um, we can adapt and just adapt them so they're better suited towards dealing with some of the climate issues. Um, I think that would require some expertise in order to do that. I don't think that that's something that we would want to do as a commission. I mean, we put those guidelines together when we had a separate historic district commission. Um, we had an architect working with us, but it was you know, we, yeah, we did it kind of on our own. So I think it would be something we may want to think about, um, perhaps even a CPA application. I don't know if that's something, Sarah, that would be eligible. Sure. Uh, because so, it's not um, order. so I, we jumped on this and have already made a little bit of progress. We're having um, Louis Hasbrook, who's the, the former Northampton Building Commissioner and is also a member of the Northampton Energy and Sustainability Commission, and it's just mm -hmm. really a, a trove of knowledge about um, you know, building code and green initiatives. He's, he's taking a look at the guidelines to see if there's any unintentional roadblocks to energy efficiency Great. projects. And that would at least give us a start to be able to flag those and, and address them. Um, so he, he's okay. in the process of doing that now, but well, okay. more to come. Great. Yeah, so that that's maybe a starting point and then we'll see where we go from there. But do people feel like I do about that or is there, yeah, no. Yeah, I think it would be useful to have the conversation and I think um, to uh, get input from a lot of different kinds of experts, right? When we saw, you know, in this in this case, there was, um, you know, some specialists who had had different opinions. There's, it was not, you know, everyone didn't um, have the same way of looking at it. Um, right. And I guess I would, I would just mention too, that I think, you know, the kind of state of deterioration and how long it was in that condition, um, something that's kind of stuck in my mind, right? That we're kind of dealing with this um, situation of, you know, um, years, if not decades of deferred maintenance on the building. So um, kind of thinking about maintenance in the um, district seems like a related, related kind of an issue. Yeah. I mean, it's a unique okay. district and it includes a, you know, a wide variety of different types of buildings and different types of building elements. And the commission has always been careful to review each permit on its own merits. Um, and there's definitely no one size fits all solution, but, you know, I, I think we do want to be careful that we're not intentionally, unintentionally creating barriers for people who do want to implement energy efficiency projects in a well thought out way. Yeah, and I think that field of historic preservation has really uh, put a lot of thought into this um, and uh, many different aspects of it. Um, so I think it would be really worth exploring this in a more in-depth way and again, making modifications that are better suited to our changing needs. So, um, yeah, okay. Yep, that would be um, great. Anything, anybody else? Could I, could I just bring up something that I've been meaning to ask Sarah, but maybe this is not an inappropriate time. Um, I'm wondering what the state of our donor sign for the uh, Memorial Park at North at the State Hospital is. Let me, that's on my list, but it, it's a little okay. farther down than I, I'd like it to right. be. So let me look into that and figure it out. Okay. Um, so I'll follow up with All you. Because right. I'd like that. And we also had talked about a, a large possibly a clear sign that had old main on it. So that yes. yep. people, we have to figure out where that might go or how, how to proceed with that. Thank you. So Barbara, on that subject, have you been, I know you walk up at the park a lot. Mm -hmm. Have you been up there recently? 
Yeah. Oh, also, the, I'm glad you mentioned that. I mean, first of all, I don't think the water's on yet, but maybe they're just waiting. The DPW, at least the last time I was there, the Memorial water wasn't day. on yet. Yeah, they, they may also, wait until Memorial Day. Um, just oh, okay. To and they're also, I don't know how long the contractor of the plants is responsible, but there are a, a, a fair number of um, dead plantings this year, too. Some of the small bushes or not bushes or not even bushes like ground cover around the fountain itself but then there's some larger things that are just completely dead and i don't know if if they're still responsible for replacing them or if the dpw has to replace them just it would be you know a shame not to have those spaces developing along with the rest of the uh, landscaping yeah, un unfortunately, the warranty period on the plantings has ended, so that would be it. Yeah, I figured that's true. But is there any, what, what's our redress or what, what What should we be, who sh should we be talking to the DPW about whether they can replace them? Is there still money in our fund for paying for things for that park? Uh, there is, and there also is uh, DPW funding as there is for um, the rest of the parks. This one's a little bit more labor intensive than other parks, but th this may be something that's already on their radar. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, is that something you can make sure it is on their radar? Uh, yeah, I can check with TBW. Great, thank you. Thanks. I need to get up there and take a look and see how things are going. All right. Well, if there's no anything else, um, it's 6.57, and we could, um, I could entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. All righty. All in favor? Yes, yes absolutely. <laughs> All right. We'll see everybody in June.